Hi, I'm Paul Jay. Welcome to the analysis.news. In a few seconds, we'll be back with Bob Poland to talk about inflation. Uh, don't forget, uh, there's a donate button if you come over to the website. Uh, if you're on YouTube, hit subscribe. If you're on all the podcast platforms, uh, best thing, come on over to our website. One, where you can make a donation, and two, you can get on the email list. I'll be back in just a few seconds. A recent article in The Economist points out that, quote, in August 2020, Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, described a shift in central bank's policy framework. Quote, the economy is always evolving, he noted. Our revised statement reflects our appreciation that a robust job market can be sustained without causing an unwelcome increase in inflation, end quote. Two years later, the article quotes Powell as saying, quote, without price stability, the economy does not work for anyone. Well, we know what that means. That means raise interest rates to fight inflation. That's me saying that, not the economist. The article continues, globalization served as a gigantic shock absorber from the 1980s into the 2010s noted Isabel Schnabel of the European Central Bank, such that shifts in demand or supply were easily met through corresponding adjustments to production rather than wild swings in prices. Now that flexibility is at risk. The article continues to explain that with the pandemic, lower population growth, including in low wage areas of the world, like China and other places, and aging, there will be less labor available. And so, quote, workers may thus enjoy more bargaining power in the future, spurring wage growth and make life harder for inflation fighting central banks. I guess we should get out our violins for the poor central bankers. Now joining us is Bob Poland. Bob is co-founder of, per of Perry Institute, the Political Economy Research Institute in Amherst, Massachusetts. He's author of the book he co-authored with Noam Chomsky titled Climate Crisis and the Global Green New Deal, The Political Economy of Saving the Planet. Thanks for joining us again, Bob. Really happy to be on. Thank you, Paul. So what do you make of that? Uh, that quote from the uh, the Economist. Uh, that, I mean, they kind of say what you've been saying. <laughs> the issue is how are we going to uh, deal with inflation? Meaning, how are we going to suppress wages? Well, that is exactly what they're saying. Let's suppress wages. I would say their diagnosis of you know the cause of the uh, inflation being centered on uh, wage increase and, and wage increase being re the result of workers getting too much bargaining power is is misplaced. On top of it, their broader analysis that the uh, bargaining power of workers is resulting from uh, slower population growth and breakdown of, of uh, globalization, I think is, is not correct. Uh, I think that there has been workers um, have gotten more bargaining power as a result of coming out of the pandemic because we had these huge stimulus policies in the U.S. and the other advanced economies, and um, that gave that put a floor on the economy, and it, it it led to an increase in employment, and that's good. That was good. I mean, the stimulus policies were really unequal. There's a lot of bad things about them, but they did manage to prevent a depression. If we had had a depression, we wouldn't be talking about uh, inflation. We'd be talking about deflation. We'd be talking about workers uh, increasing unemployment drastically, uh, wages falling, incomes falling. Uh, we would be talking about debt defaults and uh, the, the financial markets in tatters. That did not happen. Uh, for all the bad things we can say about the stimulus policies, that didn't happen. So workers did get some modicum of increased bargaining power, such that in the U.S., the wage, uh, the wage in dollar terms went up by about 5% over the last year. Uh, that's the average. Um, at the same time, inflation is 8.3%. So workers' wages haven't kept up with prices, even if we say 
that there has been uh, some improvement in wage bargaining. So that's those. That's the real context. The broader context in terms of workers getting more bargaining power, if we look at over the last 50 years, broader context, workers' wages are no higher than they were 50 years ago um, at roughly $25 an hour in today's dollars. Productivity has uh, increased two and a half times. So if workers' wages had gone up over this 50-year period with productivity and not a penny higher, um, workers would be making over $60 an hour. So that's the context. So the notion of attacking workers having achieved a modest increase in bargaining power after this COVID lockdown um, really misplaces the problem. The fact that workers have gotten uh, a slight increase in bargaining power is an extremely positive development uh, relative to where we were under the COVID lockdown. Now, we we talked about this last time, but it's worth saying again. The big causes of inflation now, if I understand it correctly, is number one, the spike in energy prices, and two, the global supply chain issues, every, anything from on the food side to the uh, semiconductor chip side. Uh, there's a lot of factors that have absolutely nothing to do with wages. Uh, that's correct. Yeah, I mean, so the the big the big uh, jump over the last year was energy prices, where any you know gasoline and and heating oil were fifty sixty percent higher than a year ago. So that was due number one to getting the supply chain back up after the COVID lockdown. But then the the com oil companies. Uh, taking advantage of these shortages and uh, gouging, uh, marking up their prices because they have the price and power to do it. That is starting to uh, get reduced uh, right now. You know, the uh, gasoline prices have been flat, They're actually declining the last two months. Uh, but we're seeing a similar pattern now in, in the food sector, not to the same extreme. But because we, number one, we have the supply chain breakdowns, and then we have, because of the climate crisis, we have droughts. Um, and because of the war in Ukraine, which has created uh, food sh wheat shortages. And on top of that, we have the commodities futures market trading on food, trading on energy in the commodities market, looking at expecting future prices, and we've seen speculative spikes in prices there. Uh, so for the future prices, which then feed back into the current prices. So that combination has been pushing up food prices uh, to a significant degree. Uh, and that is all independent. It's not getting into the workers' pockets. It's getting into the pockets of the of the food multinationals. Now, if you... that. Uh, material I quoted from The Economist. Um, Powell, just two years ago, is saying essentially there's been a structural change. And I remember at the time when, there was, when the pandemic hit and there was all this talk about massive uh, stimulus, I, I would listen to Bloomberg Radio and I would hear Wall Street character after Wall Street pundit talking about, we don't need to worry about inflation. We need to pump money into the system. Uh, yeah, there's been a structural change now. We can do all this without inflation. And Powell seemed to agree with all of that. So the pandemic effect, in theory, at least, the higher energy, even the war in Ukraine, they're relatively, in the long scheme of things, temporary, one would think. But now they're talking as if there's a new structural change, that that kind of ability of the system to have... Uh, more stimulus without higher inflation. Now they're saying, oh, no, 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 that's not true anymore. I mean, what changed in their heads? Okay, so let, as long as we're quoting uh, Powell, here's a quote from just a year ago um, when they introduced the uh, stimulus policy, the Biden stimulus policies in March 2021. He said, I'm much more worried about falling short of a complete recovery and losing people's careers and lives that they built because they don't get back to work in time. So as of only a little more than a year ago, 
the Fed and the uh, U.S. administration. And globally, the issue was, you know, it's easy to forget now. I mean, with the pandemic, we had basically a global lockdown. U.S. unemployment went in uh, from February 2020 to April 2020, 3.5% to 14.5% in, in two months. And that's what we were staring at. And so the st stimulus policies were addressed to fight that. And those were the, that was the correct move. In my view, as bad as the badly designed as the stimulus policies were, they were better than not doing them. And that's what Powell is saying. So now what? So now what we have is the impact of those policies. And it's true that uh, people did not anticipate the extent of the supply shortage and these, uh, these chain, supply chain breakdowns, including me. I can't say that I said, oh, of course, this is going to happen and we're going to get 8% inflation, but that's okay. I, I don't know that anybody recognized that because we hadn't had serious inflation in 40 years. Um, now, now that it has happened as a result of the supply chain, we're starting to see these other facts that in the face of supply chain shortages, you have the businesses having corporations, big business, marking up prices, gouging, um, given this opportunity due to the supply shortages. And that's something that is the primary driver. So if you look at the uh, change in profit share of business, uh, that is the biggest single driver. It's not worker share going up, worker share of income going up with the wage increase. It's the profit share of increase, a profit share of total income of the total pie going up faster than the wage share. If the profit share were not going up faster than the wage share, then we would have inflation at exactly 5%, which we don't. And so that's really the driver. In terms of the wage increases, yeah. Um, but remember, wages went down during COVID. So we're, we're observing, thank goodness, we're observing some catch up. I mean, the biggest single area of wage increase since COVID has been in um, uh, hotel restaurant workers who faced huge layoffs and wage cuts during COVID. And now we're getting some catch up. Um, and you know what? Uh, basically, if we're saying we can't absorb those kind of wage increases, the real message is U.S. capitalism, global capitalism, U.S. capitalism cannot function with workers getting a bigger share of the overall income pie. We've had 40 years of huge inequality, and the, the basic message is that's the way capitalism has to work. Inequality is a permanent and, and, and increasingly entrenched feature. If we want to think about reversing inequality, then yeah. Wages have to go up relative to profits. And so a little bit of that is what we experience in some sectors. I know one of the arguments that's given is, you know, inflation, the, the classic definition, definition is too many dollars chasing too few goods. And if the government in the stimulus gave people money to spend and because of the pandemic, there's less goods, uh, that's inflationary. But even if that was true for a bit, I mean, that's the, one would think that affects long gone. Well, you know, in, in, a, in a very simple framework, yeah, there, there is truth to that. But again, let's put it in reverse. Uh, would we have rather had um, too few goods uh, or too, and too, much, too little spending? Would we have rather had a deflation and depression? We could have had that. Prices could have collapsed. And you'd remember... If prices collapse, that means people can't pay back their debts because their debts are fixed in dollars, but now they have less income. So we would have seen a, a financial collapse. That's what free market capitalism would have delivered for us over the last two years. So instead, we have this uh, inflationary issue, which in part, in part reflects workers catching up a little bit. But much more than that, it it re re reflects the supply shortages uh, due to the lockdowns that occurred during the COVID and businesses taking advantage. Initially, it was the fossil fuel companies. Now it's in the food sector. One thing I thought was interesting about that 
article I quoted in The Economist, um, is that maybe they're looking in a longer term structural way and that the pandemic sent them uh, an alarm that you can't trust globalization anymore. Uh, they, I think they were, they being big capital, was surprised themselves at how easily the supply chain uh, fell apart on them. And, and two, with the rival, rivalry with China, and, 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 and certainly still China being the main source of skilled discipline, relatively cheap labor, although getting less cheap by the day, which is part of the problem for them, um, that, that they can't rely, as on that quote at the end of the article, you can't, they can't rely on cheap offshore labor to force down American wages, that they're going to have to find other ways to keep American workers' wages low. Yeah, so if we go back to say the 1990s, uh, it was you know then Fed Chair Alan Greenspan was quite uh, candid, and he said even at low unemployment we're not seeing upward wage pressure, and the reason he said is because workers are, in his words, traumatized. That we have a traumatized workforce, meaning that workers are afraid of losing their jobs and bargaining power due to globalization and the attacks on unions. He didn't say that was a negative, by the way. He said that's just the reality. And that has been the reality for since the early 1980s with the onset of neoliberalism. That, that is the core feature of neoliberalism that has kept wage uh, uh, inflation down even at low unemployment. And it meant that all the models that we economists have of the relationship, low unemployment means higher inflation, the so-called Phillips curve. It broke down because even at low unemployment, workers weren't getting wage increases. Now, what has happened now? Okay, there have been these supply uh, breakdowns in the global supply chain. And to some modest extent, yes, you have wage increases in China. So it means that workers have started to get modest, very modest wage increases, which aren't even uh, maintained at an equal rate with the, uh, with the price increases. So even with workers getting the modest wage increases that they've gotten over the past year, on average, um, businesses have been able to mark up more than the wage increases. And that's why the profit share has gone up. You know, by the you know, it, it it isn't a given that every time a worker gets a raise that the businesses have to mark up their prices the equivalent amount. We could see, you know, the profit share go down. Uh, that hasn't happened. We could also see productivity go up and workers just getting a share of the overall productivity gain, which also hasn't been true for 40 years. Uh Productivity goes up. In other words, amount the average worker produces in a day goes up. Does the worker get more money as a result? No, that's not what we've been experiencing. So if we're starting to move even slightly off of this neoliberal model, that's a positive. Uh, and, and therefore, we want to shift the income distribution to be more equal. Which would include uh, doing taking serious steps to reduce the amount of monopolization in the economy. Yeah, I mean, it used to be there'd be so much competition, it wasn't so easy just to raise prices because of workers in a specific sector won more wages because you'd still have to worry about the other sectors that maybe hadn't quite yet won those wages, and competition led to a certain amount of uh, obstacles to simply passing on. Right. It's so monopolized now, it, it, it's so much easier for them to just pass on. Yeah. And, I mean, to its credit, the Biden administration has raised this point with respect to inflation control that, okay, let's start looking into enforcing the uh, antitrust, the anti-monopoly laws that are in place that have basically languished, again, for 40 odd years. Uh, some economists, including uh, Larry Summers, the well-known Harvard uh, macroeconomist, are uh, arguing, oh, no, that stuff is, it has nothing to do with inflation. That's anyone who thinks that can impact inflation is an economic illiterate. Well, that's obviously, that's not true. I mean, if you, again, if you just look at the relationship between wages going up 
and business price markups, um, at least we can drive down the uh, the degree of price markups through anti-monopoly uh, measures that are already on the books. Um, they haven't been enforced to any significant degree, but at least it is in the discussion to an extent that it hasn't been. There's a, I was watching Fox News this morning, and, which I don't do very often, but I did today. And they had this graph uh, which showed how an inflation has risen, uh, the, the CPI has risen. And it all starts from the election of Joe Biden in their graph. Uh, and as much as I, I, I'm, I'm not any great defender of the Biden administration, it's kind of funny because the, the, the big spike takes place the day he gets elected, which is kind of hard for, <laughs> for his, no, simply his election. <laughs> Yeah. And then and then there's a big spike before the big stimulus package hits. Um, but of course, in the Fox rhetoric, it's all about the stimulus package uh, causing the uh, the spike. Well, look, the first stimulus package was in March 2020. Trump was president. The stimulus package in March tw in 2020 was the same size as the one in March 2021. Then on top of that, there was another one in December 2020. Trump was still president. He lost the election. He didn't concede it. But by then he had lost the election. But nevertheless, he signed another stimulus package. The Federal Reserve, on top of these uh, government spending programs, the Federal Reserve's purchases of assets on Wall Street began in March 2020. And, you know, $4 trillion over the course of a year. And that was all before, or mostly before Biden had come into office, much less Biden doing hit the third stimulus program. So uh, the stimulus programs did contribute to preventing a collapse. And if you want to call that inflationary, then I say yay to inflationary measures because the alternative would have been worse. Again, imagine in unemployment went from three and a half percent to 14 and a half percent in two months. Unprecedented. Didn't even happen in the 1930s. Over the the 18 months from March 2020 to September 2021, one half of the workforce filed for unemployment insurance. A half of all people in the workforce had experienced unemployment. And these stimulus measures were trying to counteract that. And they succeeded. Again, they were unfair. They could have been designed much better. But they prevented a massive debt deflation and depression, the result is we did get these supply shortages, which are now feeding into the inflationary pressures because of the power of the uh, big corporations to mark up prices above wages. So we've seen in the context of all of this, a rising militancy uh, amongst workers as we record right now, uh, there was recently just a vote amongst railroad workers uh, who to rejected a deal that their union had made, and we, there may be a strike coming. Um, and it's a reflection of what's happening right across the country. Uh, there's more organizing going on. Uh, so you can start to see what it means to if you're thinking like a big capitalist, what it means when workers start to have a little leverage. And as you say, it's only a little leverage. And look what's going on. Uh, so it's it's not a surprise that's what's preoccupying big capital because they don't want they don't want more of this. No, no. So look, look, uh, pre neoliberalism from 1960 to 73, the average real wage of the average worker did go up by 50 percent. So workers did have bargaining power way back when, and they were able to uh, generate. Uh, improved living standards and a more equal income distribution. That was the outcome. From 1973, basically, to the present, we've had stagnant wages, and we've seen the ratio of the average worker's wage to the average CEO raise. The CEO's uh, compensation has gone up tenfold relative to the average worker. To put it in very round numbers, the average worker was making a little bit over $50,000 in 1973 in today's dollars and is still making 
so a bit over 50,000. The average CEO was making one and a half million around 1970. The average CEO now makes 15 million. So, uh, you know, that the, the world of today where the average CEO is making 350 times more than the average worker, that's the world they want to defend. They don't want workers to have any bargaining power. Uh, and yes, the, you know, uh, it's exciting to see the fight back that has resulted, yes, in part due to the relative somewhat tighter labor conditions that have given workers some leverage. Not a lot, but some. So the message is, if you're a worker watching this, uh, get organized. If you are organized, get organized even more to fight. And you better stop believing this system is going to deliver anything more than this to you. On its own, right. That, that's been the message for, yeah, 40, 50 years that we don't have, we have an economy which all the benefits accrue to the rich. And they, that's why inequality has uh, risen so much. Unprecedented, unprecedented, even relative to before the Great Depression. Um, and even after the financial crash of 2008, 2009, we did see some dip in what the uh, Wall Street and CEOs were making, but it went right back up due to the fact that we had stimulus policies then. And now we have another round. And the stimulus policies this time, yeah, we're starting to see workers organized to get some of those benefits. And so that's a positive. That's why the idea of, of using, you know, anti-monopoly policy to limit the price gouging uh, is, is a very positive development. And it's a way to address uh, these issues about inflation today. You know, when I grew up, uh, auto workers and I used to know some, it was pretty common in, in our neighborhood uh, for workers to have a, a, a car and maybe a second car, a cottage, never concerned about their kids going to university. They could afford it. Uh, the, the people working in the auto industry or transport, certain sectors of the economy, did that, were doing actually pretty damn well. Yeah. And, then, and, and then in 07, 08, they came after the auto workers. And they, and, and they restructured so that a starting auto worker, I believe, was making 14 bucks an hour. Uh, Frank Hammer, uh, who worked, who for many years worked there, I, he may not have been the only one that said this, but he said, this is the first time that someone working in the auto industry can't afford a car. So, so they went after the top tier of the working class, too. And now they're in the same boat. Although there used to be this, uh, you know, mentality amongst the auto workers. So we have a good health plan. Who cares about Medicare for all? Well. Right. You know, you know, workers are all in the same boat now. And uh, the better the need to give up some of the political illusions that come from that tier of the working class who actually are the ones that still have a lot of leverage. You know, people working in those sectors of the economy, if they go on strike, they close down the economy like what we might be seeing in the railroad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the idea of workers gaining leverage is really at the heart of all of this. I mean, we can read all, I read all the economics technical papers, and it's so interesting that we go through all these fancy calculations and models, but uh, fundamentally they're all about, gee, how much bargaining power are workers actually getting? And uh, what are the ways through which we can limit it? And at what point are workers gonna start losing bargaining power? That, that's at the core of these uh, economic debates going on right now. All right. Thanks very much, Bob. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news. Don't forget, there's a donate button. We can't do this without it. And subscribe. And most importantly, we need to strengthen our email list. Thanks again.